Dude, we are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Ibrahim Dogus, uh, who is representing the small and uh, medium uh, businesses for labour group on this podcast. He's also the founder and director of the Centre for Turkey Studies, a non-party political forum and think tank focusing on Turkey, and the founder of the British Kebab Awards. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Will. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is, um, what was the uh, impetus behind uh, starting up the, the small uh, and medium uh, enterprise uh, group uh, for Labour? What, what was it that made you and the other people involved decided that there was a need for, for this group to represent businesses uh, connected to the Labour Party? I mean, this, this group and the idea behind setting up a small business, um, small and medium enterprises for labor, is quite personal to me, Will. Um, I have worked in small businesses um, for decades. So at the age of 14, I started working for a small business in central London in a restaurant. And throughout my life, I have always um, seen um, how hard people in small businesses work both the, the workers within those businesses, but also the entrepreneurs, um, people who are taking risks, people who are putting their uh, life into uh, creating and starting and building up a, a business. So, um, um, and I always wanted to find a way to get uh, the people in small businesses um, connected to Labour Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in 2015, just before the national elections in May 2015, I saw a headline on Daily Telegraph uh, saying that 5,000 small businesses have endorsed Conservative Party for, um, the, for, for, for elections, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got in touch with the party officials from General Secretary's Office to Leader's Office and uh, the business, Shadow Business Secretary's Office. And I said, look, do we have something similar to counter this? Because I believe personally that small businesses are labor people. They share labor's values and they should be organized around labor ideals and labor uh, party. Um, but the response I got at the time was that we do not have such a network of small business owners uh, to do um, to, to you know to, to, to work on a counter uh, sort of a petition uh, mm-hmm. to get small businesses calling for labor's uh, endorsement. And I was a bit surprised at the time because I thought, look, this party of ours has been around for hundred years. Mm-hmm. We should have had uh, you know tens of thousands of small businesses on our data on our network. Um, you know, let alone 5,000, it should have been much bigger. But unfortunately, this was not the case at the time. So I um, made my initial inquiries uh, with the party officials uh, at the General Secretary's office. And I said, look, I would like to start up a network of small businesses to make sure uh, that we can actually uh, have, um, have this at the next opportunity, have small businesses in those Labour Party at the next election, whether they are local elections, mayoral elections, or general uh, elections. And I was encouraged um, to, to go ahead with it. But uh, initially, the reaction was that we were doing so well to win the next election. And uh, a lot of people in the party were expecting to form the next government in 2015. So uh, I was encouraged to wait a bit longer before I do anything. So that, you know, if we, as a result of the elections, then I could consider or decide what to do. As you would know, like all your listeners, we lost that election. Mm. And uh, uh, right afterwards, the leader at the time had Milliband resigned and there was a leadership contest. So it took, it, it delayed my plans a bit uh, with a few months. But before the next leadership um, election uh, results announced, I have um, organized a dinner uh, with, uh, with my co-founder, Sonny Leong, who mm-hmm. is also the, um, the chair of Chinese for Labour, which right now it's called South, Southeast Asians for Labour. So together we decided to go ahead with launching the organization and we uh, called on small business owners and supporters to join us for a, for a launch dinner uh, at a venue in North London. We initially thought it would be lucky to get 50 or 100 people, but believe me, we had 500 people mm. at, the, at the function mm. and it was a huge uh, event in a way because there wasn't such a network in place to bring all these people together. So every one of us worked really hard to put the message out and we had about 25 of our Labour MPs um, present at the launch. And as a result, we launched the organization. 
So we founded SME for Labour, and the idea was quite simple. We wanted um, small business people to be um, supporting Labour, and we wanted Labour Party to, to, to find out more about issues affecting small businesses directly from small business owners and people working within small businesses. And that was the reason we, we launched and um, started the organisation. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what would you uh, see as, as, as the role of the group um, in the Labour Party? Is it uh, simply to connect the, the Labour Party with small uh, uh, business owners or, or do you see it as a means of influencing uh, Labour's policy in relation to business and, and small businesses? It, it, it's both in a way. For small business owners and people working in small businesses, the, uh, the, the ultimate goal is to make sure they have a meaningful effect or impact on Labour's policies towards small businesses. But for the party, it's to make sure that the party gets more support from small businesses, um, whether from owners or from uh, workers within those small businesses. So it's, it's both. So we need to make sure that the party is well represented among the small businesses, but also small businesses are well represented within the party ranks. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there is often a perception uh, that the Labour Party, as, as you men- mentioned there with the, the letter in 2015 from a variety of uh, business owners supporting the Conservatives, there is a perception that the Labour Party is not perhaps a, a party of business or a party associated with business. Why do you think it is that there are some people who don't see the Labour Party as the party of business, the party that can work with business and, and ensure that uh, small businesses succeed and thrive? I think that perception is mainly around the largest businesses in the country. It's for it's about the corporates like Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, all those largest corporates um, you know, in, in the country. Mm-hmm. I think Labour has always been the party of businesses, but those businesses were businesses within the communities, businesses who are generating wealth and um, spending that wealth within their own communities, well, you know, local businesses, widely supported by labor councils across the country. So I believe that labor has always been pro-business, always been very supportive of businesses, but um, the smaller section of the business community is, has the loudest voice in the country mm-hmm. because they have the resources, they have the means, they have the media channels that they can reach out to uh, millions of people, unlike a small uh, restaurant owner or a small butcher or a small grocery shop in a corner um, or you know, in, a, in, a, in a different part of the country who doesn't have much voice. They have not been well organized. And I think that's, that's the issue that we need to tackle as Labour Party. We need to make sure we organize those businesses and we give them a, a voice, a loud voice possible, as loud as possible, because then I think we will um, you know, break into that meat where they claim or where there's a perception built by the largest corporates, I would say, that Labour is not business friendly. I, I believe other way, other, you know, otherwise, and I think Labour has always been supportive, um, supportive of the uh, small businesses, and this should um, continue in a much uh, bigger scale. Now. Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, one of the things that has really affected um, businesses, particularly high street businesses in recent times, has been the pandemic, which has, of course, uh, harmed them, not just because of um, footfall, but of course, um, the pandemic has also impacted the people actually working in those businesses. What do you think should be the main priorities going forward in terms of helping businesses, particularly high street businesses, get back on their feet and ensure that they feel safe and that their customers feel safe going into these businesses and returning to visiting the businesses and, and, and helping uh, regenerate the local economy? I mean, businesses have been very cautious in terms of the measures they have taken to make sure that both um, their their staff, members of staff, and their customers are safe Mm. and able to visit their premises on a regular basis as they used to. There are a few things that um, we should demand from the current Tory government who have not been um, friends of of small business community. And we have seen this in practice throughout the the COVID pandemic. I mean, I would say um, the government needs to extend... Uh, until December 22, 22 at least, the VAT reduction for the tourism and hospitality, which mm-hmm. is due to expire um, next month. I mean, they have to, or they should, uh, restore until December 2022 a full business rate holiday and scrap the partial relief, which is due to expire in March next year. I mean, they, they, they need to consider um, to restore, restoring um, tax forbearance for SMEs and the injustice by which 
HMRC is slapping interest charges mm. on small firms who delayed payment uh, amid um, uh, the, the pandemic. And, and, you know, there's got to be a way to retain a reduced furlough scheme for sectors uh, hit, hit hardest by lockdowns, such as tourism uh, and hospitality. Um, I mean, it's important to revise the outdated system of business rates. Mm. As you may know, uh, it's an inflexible fixed tax on businesses. Mm -hmm. Whether you, um, you have a turnover or not, you have to pay a fixed um, tax on your premises. And this is to be brought in, in a, I, I believe government needs to consider bringing in um, a, a levy based on each trader's turnover or profits, which would make sense and it would be fair. So we'll be able to tackle uh, companies like Amazon or Facebook and others who avoid paying uh, business rates and a small shopkeeper on a high street will end up paying thousands of pounds mm -hmm. on, um, on, bus uh, on business rates. So it's important to consider a reform uh, of business taxation to level the playing field between the major online retailers and bricks and mortar SMEs. You know, if you have a small restaurant, uh, they'll be paying a huge amount in tax. They have no way of not paying that tax, but uh, online retailers will find a way not to pay any tax mm -hmm. because they will be based offshore or they'll be based in a tax haven. Their income will be shifted from UK or their profit will be shifted from UK to another, you know, to, to tax haven. Then they will avoid paying any tax on that. I mean, it's important to rewrite the rules of rents, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, which are often the biggest bill for small firms. Um, this should include a shift from, again, fixed quarterly payments, maybe to a system based on turnover too. And it mm -hmm. will be a fair deal for the tenants, but also for the landlords. So if those premises on high street, if we are all collaborating, landlords, tenants, local wow. authority, government, and we're all cooperating to make a business a success, then I think everybody will be winning um, if things are not fixed in terms of cost to onto the small business owners, the tenants mm -hmm. in this case. So these are the basic things I think one needs to consider to make sure our high streets are thriving rather than failing because um, across the country, so many, I mean, there was a report I saw two days ago, thousands of, um, you know, high street based businesses have closed their doors forever and they may not come back unless the government takes action and provides the, the most needed support to those small businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you mentioned furlough there, yeah. and of course, this is something that has been um, increasingly important as a lifeline, uh, not just for businesses, but for individuals uh, as well. And the government are obviously intent on uh, regaining uh, the, the furlough payments that were given out during the, the height of the pandemic. How um, fair do you think that is? And how long do you think it will actually take some businesses to fully repay the money that was given during the, the furlough period? I mean, the, the key here is to make sure people still have jobs. Mm. So what they've done through furlough is, is great. It was very helpful uh, to keep millions of people employed. But now we have an actual problem coming up. Business has not returned to normal levels for most businesses. And if furlough ends uh, next month, uh, then there will be a huge number of people made redundant. And then you'll have, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not more, people um, who will be looking for jobs. And there's, at the same time, you have vacancies in, in other uh, trades, in other uh, professions. But there's no proper training facilities for people to shift jobs immediately to move on to something new. So those small businesses on high streets, for them to survive, the government needs to find a way to be a bit more flexible on its furlough too. So people are open up, opening up now. And they are beginning to invite many more of their workforce. But I mean, not many businesses are still on 100% of their workforce um, being back uh, at work yet. So um, there's certainly a need for a transition period. So if it's a six-month period or a 12-month period, government needs to be flexible and supportive of those small businesses so they can make sure they keep those jobs alive. And then people who, um, who are on furlough might be able to come back, hopefully, to their jobs. Um, and those jobs will still be uh, available to them. Mm. Now, something that I imagine is um, concerning for uh, a lot of small business owners at the moment are the proposals being discussed and potentially being put forward by the government for an increase in national insurance as a means of paying for social care. What impact do you think that this will have on um, businesses and on individuals if we do see uh, an increase in national insurance I mean, rates? 
you would know that the cost of living in Britain is, is on constant rise. Mm -hmm. Whether it's to do with pandemic directly or whether it's to do with Brexit directly, the cost of living in Britain is on rise. But the income of those small businesses, but also of those people working in small businesses, is not on rise. So people's income have not gone up, but people's cost of living has gone up. Their rents have gone up, um, their travel costs have gone up, uh, their food bills have gone up. So everything you know is that is linked to living is on rise, but the wages and the income uh, of those small businesses is not on rise. So an additional cost uh, through national insurance contributions to, in the, to to workers, but also to small businesses, is not the fairest way of um, raising money to pay for social care. We have to pay for social care mm -hmm. as a country. It, it, it's a vital thing, and it's got to be dealt with. Uh, rather than delaying for another decade or so. But it's got to be a fair way, it must be a fair way of raising the money needed. So those on the top um, 1% of income bracket have done really well during the pandemic. They have increased their turnover, they have increased their profits, likes of Amazon, Facebook, all those largest corporates in the country. So there's got to be a proper wealth tax laid on those largest corporates where you get most of the income needed for the social care budget. But then, you know, if there is still a need for money, which I guess there will be, and then you can consider coming back to workers and small business owners and say, look, we've done all we can to raise the money needed from the largest corporates in this country, but the money we have raised is not enough. We have managed to raise 80% of the cost needed, but there's still 20% that we need to raise. And we have to raise this through national insurance contribution or through some other means, but from the millions of people, you know, workers and small businesses. So that will be a fair thing to come back to people. But starting with people who have not seen an increase in their income, but have seen a huge increase in their cost of living is not the fairest thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, now I'd like you just to turn to Brexit for a moment. Um, we've seen um, perhaps not, not as um, much in the news due to the pandemic, but we have seen stories related to Brexit, related both to uh, certain shortages of particular items in supermarkets, shortages of um, HGV drivers in particular sectors related, again, to the supermarket industry. But what sort of impact have you seen uh, of Brexit in relation to um, small uh businesses because of course you mentioned the hospitality business um the sector there and of course hospitality is one of the areas in which um eu workers predominantly um worked quite a quite, quite a bit so what sort of impact have you seen from from brexit on small businesses i mean two key things one um is the labor shortage um a lack of uh, people um mm -hmm. willing or ready and able to work within the hospitality industry at this moment of the time secondly it's the supply chain so we've, because supply is, um, there's a negative impact on supply chain, there are less products coming into UK or products are delayed to come in, you know, from coming into UK. Therefore, the prices of available products has gone up. So like the cost of living on an individual worker, the cost of running a business has gone up. So we used to, I mean, I run uh, restaurants in London. So um, I'll give you an example about meat supply. So we uh, have a kebab restaurant uh, in Waterloo called South Bank uh, Kebab Kitchen. Mm -hmm. So we would pay, for example, normally on average eight pounds per kilo for a lamb uh, product that we buy for a special dish we do. The price of that lamb product has gone up to 16 pounds. You know, it has doubled mm. in price. But our menu price had to remain the same because our customers cannot afford to pay for a product, for a dish on the menu, where they used to pay 14 pounds they cannot pay £28 for the same dish. Mm. So we either remove that dish from the menu or we end up selling the dish with a loss so that we can keep going as a business in a way in terms mm. of having the flagship dishes on our menu. This is a very basic thing from the meat-related sort of restaurants, for example. But every other product from vegetables you know, to chicken, mm. so you may have seen reports about uh, you know, Nando's, KFC's, have yeah. not, you know, they have these are large operators and they rely on a huge um, network of chicken supply to mm. keep their businesses going. They are considering to close down some of their sites for a, for a certain period of time just because they could not get uh, the, the chicken supply they need into their mm. premises. That's again, you know, in terms of products. 
So we have seen when you go into a, uh, in a supermarket, you're beginning to realize that some of the products you rely on, you took for granted, you know, you go into a, a, a Sainsbury's, you want to buy, I don't know, a certain Spanish product, you, you no longer are able to do that because, mm. or, you know, if, they, if they're lucky, they will find a, a different product with, you know, same maybe ingredients and so on, but you'll be able to uh, get all of a different product rather than the one that you took for granted for years and years that you like, you rely on. So mm. things are changing. It's, it's forcing us to change our um, sort of shopping habits, you know, the products we're buying and using, which up, up to a point might be okay. But if, th- if those products also run out and the supply gets um, you know, negatively impacted continuously through you know, due to Brexit and so on, uh, I think we will, um, we will have a lot more problems than we, we, we see now. Mm. Now, the government have uh, suggested that uh, replacing trade uh, from the EU, uh, British businesses could work uh, much more closely with um, companies in Australia, India, the United States, etc. I mean, how realistic do you think that is, that trade from those nations could um, replace trade that otherwise would have come from the EU? It, I mean, it's possible, but it may not happen immediately. Mm. The problem is I, the government... Um, seem to have no transition plan. So they, they, I think they have not had a proper planning for a period of time, for the transition period of time in a way. Because if they are going to start trading and get Australia or India to replace the trade we had with Netherlands, Spain mm-hmm. for vegetables, with Poland on chicken, with, um, with the other countries for different products within the European Union, they should have had some sort of a, a period of time where they build up this a trade before they end, uh, you know, before they stop having, um, you know, having, you know, the, before they stop having the regular, um, mm. uncontrolled or free travel of, of products and people uh, from European Union. But I, I, I think they failed to plan that. They thought maybe that things will be done very quickly. That you just sign a deal with Australia and then you start having lots of um, lamb and chicken coming over, so you don't have to rely on Netherlands or Spain or, or on Poland anymore. But, you know, and then we had have, we have pandemic. So now, you know, uh, there's, there's Brexit and pandemic at the same time. This was not the best time to plan um, you know, Brexit, maybe. Um, you know, you could say it's, it's a huge coincidence. It's a terrible coincidence to happen. Mm. But, um, you know, businesses and the workers in this country are paying the price for mismanagement of the process by government, I would say. Mm. Now, of course, um, the environment and the environmental uh, impact of, of, of businesses and um, whether they be uh, through manufacturing or whether they be through uh, the hospitality sector or the tourism sector, etc., has, of course, been something that has been uh, discussed and uh, debated, uh, particularly over the, the, the past few years. How important do you think it is for businesses to uh, recognise the need to adhere to certain um, ideas and suggestions in terms of sustainability relating to um, carbon emissions and relating to uh, climate change? And how willing do you think businesses are to uh, change potentially the way that they operate to um, operate in a more uh, climate secure and a more climate effective way? I, mean, I, I genuinely believe businesses in the UK are quite um, responsible businesses, mm-hmm. they're good businesses. And, you know, they are embedded, in particular small businesses, they're embedded within their communities. So any concern um, among their communities is a concern to them. So Mm -hmm. I think they're trying their best to adapt uh, to, to, you know, it is not easy for those small businesses to Mm -hmm. become zero carbon uh, businesses Mm -hmm. in a short period of time. They need proper uh, support. They need um, proper advice from uh, the right departments within the government and so on. But I think people who are running those businesses are trying their best to adapt their businesses into the new um, norm in terms of um, tackling climate change, making sure that they are um, you know, becoming, gradually becoming carbon free um, the businesses. And, you know, and they know that this will benefit their businesses. If they could become more sustainable as businesses, um, you know, then their, their, their consumers um, will pay more attention to, to the work they have done and they will probably see an increase in their business. Because our consumers in Britain are quite, um, you know, uh, well-informed consumers. They make mm. choices based on businesses, businesses, you know, decisions made by businesses affecting cl- from climate change to other 
uh, local issues. Um, and I think uh, small businesses in particular are trying really hard to adapt their businesses to the new uh, model of um, tackling uh, climate change. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, you are uh, also uh, the founder and director of the Centre for Turkey um, Studies. And I just wondered, um, what sort of impact do you think uh, the recent developments in Afghanistan, the Taliban's taking over uh, of Afghanistan, will have on Turkey? Because I know that there will obviously be um, people from Afghanistan who will be trying to seek refuge in um, Turkey. And Turkey already has uh, certain problems with uh, uh, the amount of refugees that, that, that want to enter the country. So what issues do you think uh, the current situation in Afghanistan will have for Turkey? The, the immediate impact will be the increase in um, uh, Afghan, Afghan people um, tra- travelling into Turkey to claim mm-hmm. asylum or to use Turkey as a hub to travel into, uh, into Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, politically, um, it, it's a bigger uh, problem because Turkey um, in, in the Middle East was seen as not doing enough, for example, to tackle Islamic State terrorists Mm. from targeting Kurdish forces in northwestern Syria or or from uh, Islamic State terrorists targeting Yazidis in in Iraq and so Mm -hmm. on. So Turkey has not done enough as a country to stop um, those, you know, those terrorists from moving into those um, uh, territories. So Taliban, um, Turkey has made some statements saying that they can find a way to work with Taliban, which... Mm -hmm in a way might might work um, in terms of Turkish government uh, having a presence in, uh, in Afghanistan to, to support Western um, allies. Mm. But at the same time, um, it may create further problems uh, for Turkey um, because um, they, there are lots of political and economical issues in Turkey. Mm-hmm. And Turkey does not, um, I mean, the Turkish regime at the moment is not seen within the, within the country um, there's, there's a huge opposition to the current president, for example, mm-hmm. who is known to be um, keeping a, 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 you know, a blind eye to um, radical Islamist um, terrorism mm-hmm. um, in, in the region. So this could be a problem because in Afghanistan, uh, and Afghanistan under Taliban is not going to be a safe place for people who are not willing to have a certain way of life mm. uh, imposed on them by Taliban. And it will be dangerous for them. And if Turkey is not seen as supporting those people, but rather taking a position alongside Taliban, and their credibility across the world will also be tarnished. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of danger in Turkey uh, being uh, practically um, um, sort of uh, present in Afghanistan. Uh, but also, even if they chose not to do that at this stage now, they will have um, hundreds of thousands of refugees um, coming into Turkey. That will create another burden on you know, in terms of financial burden mm-hmm. on, the, on, on Turkey, uh, but Turkey has never been um, a good host uh, for refugee communities. Mm. So they had um, almost 3 million Syrian refugees, um, and European Union in particular have provided huge funds for Turkish government to provide support to refugee communities in mm-hmm. terms of settling them, in terms of uh, sheltering them, in terms of you know, upskilling them to create jobs and so on. But there's been, uh, there's been reports around this particular funding, which is in billions of euros, that there has been a lot of corruption uh, on the top of the government um, uh, in in relation to the funding they have received for refugees and the conditions refugee communities in Turkey are living under are uh, are terrible. Mm. Uh, And that's purely uh, because the funding provided by uh, European Union and other countries have not been used to support those refugees. And I'm worried that uh, something similar might happen um, to, you know, in relation to Afghan refugees from Afghanistan as well. Mm. Um, it's been uh, great speaking to you, uh, Ibrahim, and we're coming towards um, the end of the podcast, but I have one uh, final question. Uh, we touched uh, a little bit upon um, coronavirus, not a great deal, but a, a, a little bit uh, upon it. And of course, because of the pandemic, it has affected all of our lives and, and changed the way uh, that we uh, live our lives. So when things do finally uh, get back to uh, normal and get back to how they were prior to the pandemic, which will hopefully um, be soon, uh, what one thing that you haven't been able to do because of the pandemic are you most looking forward to being able to do again? I mean, uh, the only thing I have missed doing is to take my kids um, to, to holiday mm-hmm. um, abroad, to a seaside uh, sort of uh, you know, a family holiday. Yeah. That's the thing I'm missing. 
you know, apart from that, it's been difficult for all of us, mm-hmm. um, as you have uh, put it very um, clearly. And, and hopefully things will start getting better now. We'll start going back to normal. Um, you know, there will be businesses will get back to normal. People will start going back to their work normally. And, uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll start uh, recovering from uh, the, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And it may not be easy, uh, but together um, as a country, we're, we're quite resilient. And I think we will do better uh, if we stick together and continue to, um, to, you know, to keep our businesses safe uh, for people, uh, for customers and for staff, and make sure that we are um, optimistic for the future of our country. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, thank you once again for coming on the podcast. If people want to find out uh, more about the group and more about you, uh, where should they go to find out uh, more? I mean, um, smeforlabor.org is our website and we are also on social media um, and SME for Labour is our Twitter uh, handle and also it's our Facebook page. We have a lot of um, functions and fringe meetings and receptions at the Labour Party conference. If any of your listeners are attending the La- Labour Party conference, please do come along and join us at our fringe events and receptions. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Will. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast, or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.